Welcome to Morgan News Now on Bear TV. We're your hosts, Ayanna Francis and Serena Chapel, with the latest news at Morgan State University. Today is April 14, 2022. First off, Shaquille Brewster, MSNBC, and NBC News correspondent joined us here in the studio. I'm Kayla Kay. Joining me today is Shaquille Brewster, correspondent from NBC News and MSNBC. First off, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. How have you been enjoying the campus? Oh, it's been great. Uh, I, this is my first time here at Morgan. I've been to Baltimore before, but it's first time here. I know your dean from when I was a college student at Howard. She was my professor, um, so it was good catching up with her, and she gave me a great tour of the, the building. It's really nice. You guys have some really good equipment here. Yes, that's great to hear. <laughs> So my first question is, tell me a little bit about your work at NBC News and MSNBC. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a correspondent, as you mentioned, uh, with NBC News and, and, and MSNBC. Uh, essentially what that is, that's a reporter. Um, it's a reporter, and I give reports across uh, all platforms um, and do it for the national broadcast and anywhere. Um, I'm based in Chicago, but... I was just telling a, one of your classes, I was in uh, Ohio earlier this week. I went, did a story in Chicago, and now I'm here in Baltimore, and I already have an email about what I'm uh, doing the next story, and I need to know what, where that's going to be. Um, but, I mean, the easiest way to put it is I go to places all across the country. If there's a story that has some sort of national interest or national impact or implication, uh, I'm there. I'm talking to people on the ground. I'm doing interviews, I'm doing research, and then I present it to viewers on MSNBC or NBC News or whatever platform that may be. So what surprised you the most about the working environment, like you going to different places and everything? I think what surprises you the most is just uh, how many places there are. <laughs> like I, I've been doing this job for a good, this one, this particular job I've been doing for two years, but before that, I was on the campaign trail for both the 2020 campaign and 2016 campaign. And there are many times where I think I'm going somewhere I've been before and then realize, oh, I've never been here. It's brand new people I'm talking to um, and trying to learn that quickly, learn, you know, what's important in every different in different places and uh, try to connect that to people. So I think the biggest surprise is how big of an area, you know, you can say you're going to Columbus, Ohio and still never have been where that story is happening at that moment. Um, so you, you get to learn a lot and learn and quickly learn uh, what each place has to offer. So I saw that you did extensive reporting on the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Here in Baltimore, we have similar cases like the 18 year old Donnell Rochester last month. Do you have any advice for student journalists covering police brutality? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's something that is hard to cover. It's difficult to cover, especially for journalists of color, especially when you're a student. Um, I'll say my first story, ever, uh, let me not say first story ever, my first uh, big story that I was assigned to working at NBC was actually the death of Freddie Gray here in Baltimore. And I uh, was filling in for someone that weekend uh, when the protests really went from peaceful, quiet demonstrations to large scale, um, you know, clashes with police um, and I was f months in at NBC News I was a fellow I was part of a fellowship and I was replacing a associate producer and I had to learn really quickly um, you know what it's like to cover a big demonstration that got national attention uh, I think you know one thing that I learned very very early on was you know talk to him as many people as you can um, if it's a protest that's surrounding, you know, in response to whatever action happened, um, you know, learn the protest organizers, learn, meet, meet people there, listen to what they're saying, and stay in contact with those people. Because there are plenty of times where I would meet someone at a protest, don't think that they have anything to do with the story or that they're going to be able to help me tell the story for that day. But because I got their phone number, that was someone I was able to reach out to a couple of days later and say, I remember you mentioned some school. That's a school that we now learn, you know, is involved in this. Can I talk to you about it? Um, so I think the big thing, talk to as many people as you can. And you really have to stay on top of this story, which is harder for you guys now than it probably has ever been because it's not just, you know, going and talking to the police chief 
or the police official. It's also looking online at tweets and what people are tweeting about and what pictures are they're sharing or video they're sharing, looking on Facebook, other social media platforms. There's a lot that you have to keep up with, um, but it's, it's part of the job. So would you say the same thing for covering murders and crimes in Baltimore, or do you have any other different advice to offer? Yeah, I'm, so I think the big thing is, and I, I guess I didn't answer this part of it uh, for your last question, but you want to make sure that you fully know the story. Uh, know everything that's out there. If there was a police report, learn everything about the police report. Don't rely exclusively on the police report. That's one source of information. Uh, if there was a, a if, if there was a location that's made public where this happened, where it's a shooting or whatever it may be, uh, go to that location, visit the location, learn about that area, um, meet people there and talk to people in that area. Um, because again, even if it's not relevant for you today, it may be relevant for you in the future. So uh, I think, you know, definitely do whatever you can to learn that story and all elements of the story, you know, especially the first rush of when, when something happens, when there's a police shooting, you know, the first thing that we get is that statement from police. You may hear from the family. That's your starting point, but expand beyond there um, because you never know where the story can take you. You never know what twists and turns can come from uh, the story, and it's your job to make sure that the information that people know, that it's accurate, that it has the appropriate context, and it's your job to kind of ask those questions that people are already going to be asking. And that's whether or not you're talking about a police situation or a murder or a shooting. It's that same kind of concept that you're approaching that situation with. Got you. So speaking of like with po police reports and everything, say that there was someone that you want to interview a source and they did not want to give you the information. So Happens how would you? Yeah. So how would you deal with that? Uh, it, it, it depends. It depends on who or what that source is. Um, I'll start with the official sources. Uh, I mentioned I spent a lot of time on the campaign trail. So that's, for me, it was always assigned to a specific candidate. So there's that candidate, there's that communications director, sometimes campaign manager. You're reaching out to multiple people with that one entity and you're hoping that in your regular conversations with them that they're giving you some information or that they're answering your questions. Um, the biggest misconception is it's not just, you know, talking to them and, you know, pick up the phone and call the campaign manager and they tell you something. No, you do your research beforehand. You're talking to people around it. You learn some things and then you ask the campaign manager or the candidate whatever that question is. You most likely know the answer, but now I need you to say it on the record. Now I'm asking you this specific thing and that's how you build out your sources and that's how you build out the information. Uh, in terms of when you deal with someone who doesn't want to speak to you, I mean, there's different levels to it. You know, so many times we go out and we do MOS, you know, man on street interviews. You go out and you try to get their opinion on something that happened recently. You can't force anyone to talk to you. <laughs> if someone says no, you know, you, you let it go. Um, sometimes you have people who hesitate a little bit, like, oh, you know, I don't really want to be on camera, or I hear a lot, I didn't get my hair done today. You, you hear that and you, uh, try to, you try to comfort them before the camera goes on. Can you just tell me what you think about this? That's what I, that's a line I use all the time. I, before we, like, we're not going to record, but can you just tell me what you think of this question? And you have the conversation, you make them comfortable with you, and then they may be more willing to go on there um, and answer your question. So that's how, you, you know, a lot of it is the personal interaction. I think whether it's a candidate or a man on the street interview that you're doing uh, in response to whatever news is happening that day, it's about making people comfortable with you and, you know, making them tr be able to trust you, some level of trust, and that's especially hard when they don't know you, but it's about building that trust either over a long period of time or sometimes within seconds. I agree. <laughs> so how do you manage the stress of tight deadlines and just about your job in general, like you mentioned the campaign, so how did you yeah. manage just being on the road a lot? Yeah, tight deadlines, I mean, that is what the job is. Um, that, you know, from, from, from the most part, I'll say for me, um, that is what the job is because, um, you know, when I wake up in the morning, my first live shot usually is in the seven o'clock hour. So most of the time I have to have what I'm going to say at seven or what I'm going to uh, report at seven a.m. I've been working on that the night before um, in terms of the day before I interviewed someone so I can have a sound bite to toss to or I've done the research already so I can, you know, make sure I have that report ready to go at seven a.m. But you know, a lot of times stories are developing really quickly and you're trying to synthesize a lot of information into a very short period of time. And 
you don't have that much time to <laughs> bring all of this to that, that short amount. Uh, so you, you just kind of got to get it done. You, you have to follow the deadlines. The biggest thing is you can't miss a deadline. If you have a story, you need to get something on there. If, you have, if your story is due at 6 p.m. for the 6 p.m. newscast, you need to have something for the 6 p.m. newscast. It might not be the I exact interview you wanted. You might not have been able to fact check that one fact that you really thought was going to take it over the top, but you have to make sure you get it done, and a lot of that goes to time management. And that goes to the second part of your question because when you're on the road so much, uh, it's all about time management. You have to know how far away the airport is from the live shot location or how far your hotel is from the live shot location. Oh, an interview just came up for 2 p.m. You have a 2.45 uh, live shot. Do you have time to do that interview or do we have to move that interview uh, earlier or later? So a lot of it is time management and just figuring it out. But the biggest thing is you need to make sure that you're there when you need to be on TV with a complete project because if not, then you're in pretty serious trouble. Got you. So I want to take you back to your college days. Uh -oh. What opportunities in college yeah. did you do to get to where you are now? Um, I think the biggest thing in terms of the most um, valuable would be the internship experiences I had in college. Um, and I'll start even before I got that first internship. I'm sure many of you here have had this experience where you apply for an internship and you either, hear, you either don't hear back at all or you hear back, um, we, we want a little bit more experience. And you're like, I need the first one to be able to, I need to get some experience to have experience. And uh, part of what I did is once I kept bumping into that, that wall, I created a blog. And I called it navigatingpolitics.com. I think it might still be, <laughs> I'd have to check. Um, but navigatingpolitics.com. And when there were political discussions that impacted people I know, I would write a blog post about it. There were budget, you know, a new budget came out. I would write a story about how it impacted students at HBCUs. Um, there was a, a Libya, uh, President Obama was launching, there was some military engagement in Libya and I wrote a blog post about what that means for folks here. Um, and the bottom line is I, I created that opportunity for myself. I, people weren't giving it to me, so it's like, all right, let me at least do that. I worked with the student-run television station because in my in the curriculum, we weren't able to really touch a camera freshman year and for like most of sophomore year, but I got in with the TV station and I was working with the senior people in, t in the TV station and I got to get the experience of holding a camera and putting a story together and that was something that wasn't given, but I kind of pushed at it. So a lot of it is just pushing. You get that, if you can't get that ex internship, you do it yourself, but beyond that, uh, get internships. Do as much, do as many internships as you can. Get as much experience as you can because that's what that first employer is going to look at. And in those interviews, they're going to say, what stories have you done? What, have, what news have you been able to break? Or give me an example of when you, you know, wrote something that's really compelling. They're going to want to see that exact work. Got you. And I know I asked you a little bit more about just the advice about managing stress and everything, but mm -hmm. I want to ask you more in a general sense, what advice can you give to student journalists on how to reach your level of success? Uh, I, I think you have to, a few different things. One, I think you should be open to any opportunity, um, even if it's not what you think you had in mind for yourself. It wasn't according to your own plan. Uh, me, for example, I'm a correspondent now. I started as a producer at NBC News. I, I started as a fellow, and then I did some work on the campaign trail, but I was a producer. And the transition from going to producer to on air was not one that I was trying to do. I, I loved producing. I was saying, oh, I want to be a bureau chief. I, I'm fine with, you know, behind the scenes. I'm locked in here. This is what I want to do. But when I was producing a story ahead of the 2018 midterm elections, um, you know, I went in and they said, you know, we're going to send a correspondent with you. We'll send a reporter. And I said, okay. So I found a live shot location. I found people to talk to. I got all the interviews, got it all ready to go. That Sunday I say, all right, so who's coming with me? <laughs> like, who's the reporter I need to give this to? And they say, there's no one available, but we really want the story. Can you do it? And I had to pivot. I had to be the person on air re reporting that story. And I did it that day. I did, the, I did it the next day. And then two weeks before the election day, I was on TV every single day. And my job was producing. Um, so that was me being open to the opportunity and being ready for when that opportunity comes. You don't know what that is, but because I knew the story back in front, because I was essentially going to hand this story to the correspondent who was going to come, I was able to kind of flip on the other side and, and, and do that. Um, so I think, you know, be open to any opportunity, be ready for the opportunities. 
and just you know always uh, have a good positive energetic uh, attitude. You want to make sure that you're any opportunity that you have that you're maximizing it that people can look at the work that you're doing within the uh, role and responsibility that, that you have and they know okay when I give this person an assignment I know it's gonna get done if you're an intern and they give you a, a hey we want a couple of bullet points on the economy or there's this new poll that just came out can you read it and give me some bullet points make sure that they are the best bullet points that that anchor will ever get, that they're cleanest to read, you know, whatever it is. If you have to go off and, you know, it's been assignments where it's like, uh, if I were, I, you know, I'm, you're coming to interview me and I should have had a tie on, and, you know, I spilled something on my tie, we need someone to go get him a tie. Well, you're going to get the best tie that works out for this because you're, they can rely on you for anything uh, that they give you. So it's just, you know, making sure that with those assignments you're, you're maximizing it and you're, doing, you're working to the best of your ability because you don't know what those opportunities can turn into and you don't know who's watching them, who's watching you as you're performing those tasks. Yes, that is wonderful advice. <laughs> and you sound like you had a, such an amazing career journey, even though your journey is still going on. And I just hope for the best for you. Thank you. And thank you again for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Happy to be here. Yes. And I'm Kayla Cade, and this has been For Morgan Now. We would like to thank Shaquille Brewster for coming to speak with us. I Love Morgan Week arrives on April 25th with events like Morgan Madness and Karaoke. We're also having special guests G Herbo and Tusi in concert on April 27th. Tickets are available at the Student Center. In more serious news, students protested the killing of 18-year-old Donald Rochester by police. Zakia Jennings has a story. I am outside of Baltimore City Hall where a number of Morgan State University students have continued to march to in protest of the murder of Donnell Rochester. Donnell Rochester was an 18 year old boy who was murdered by Baltimore City Police Department on February 19th. Morgan State students have continued to come together starting at Morgan's campus, marching all the way to City Hall and as well as marching all the way to the police department to demand justice for Donnell. He was shot! He was shot! He was handcuffed! Protests began March 25th and have continued since then. Protesters even took over I-83 to get their point across. In the midst of protests and candlelight vigils, Donnell's aunt and community organizer Joshua Turner shared their thoughts on Morgan's presence for Donnell. Today was just truly like amazing like for me and my family to like witness you know so many students coming out who did not know Darnell at all and I just we just seen the passion we felt the passion from them like you would have thought Darnell was like their cousin a still classmate whatever but it was just so amazing to really be around them and for them to really march for Darnell like from Morgan to City Hall that was truly amazing and to hear them yelling screaming crying for Darnell like that really brought joy to me and my sister's heart. Be a Darnell. In the next 15 seconds, I could be a Darnell. In the next five seconds, any one of them peers can decide to come over here and make one of us a Darnell. Yeah. That's the reality that we live in. You afforded that comfort because it wasn't you. Yeah. Darnell's mother does not have that comfort. Yep. The family, as well as the Morgan State community and the Baltimore community are demanding justice and are demanding Mayor Brandon Scott and the Baltimore Police Commissioner to step up and serve justice. I'm Zakia Jennings, reporting for Morgan Now. Finals are coming, but don't panic. Here are a few tips for a smooth finals week. Pace yourself. Remember 1159 is a deadline and not a suggestion. Take one step at a time and plan which days you'll complete a final or project. We'd like to congratulate our cheer team for placing second at the National Cheerleaders Association Collegiate Nationals in Daytona, Florida. Thank you for tuning in to Bear TV. I'm Ayanna Francis. And I'm Serena Chapel. And, and this, this has been Morgan, Morgan News Now. Now.